Hello and welcome to your Lab 2 instructional video. So again, the purpose of this video is to really give you an opportunity to walk through the lab. So what I would do again is make sure that you have the lab available, either as a PDF or as a paper copy, and just go with this lab with me and we'll kind of work through it uh, step by step. So this lab introduces topographic maps and Google Earth. So this lab is in addition to Lab 1, where we learn more about latitude and longitude. This lab in particular will teach us how do we make maps, which are particularly square, when looking at a globe that is round. So as learned through lecture, we know it is impossible to take an orange and peel an orange into a perfect square. If you were to peel an orange, it may look something like this. If you notice the arrow, uh, my pointer is pointing at this uh, view of the globe with no distortion as a on a flat surface. So as this lab says, our Earth is very complex. Uh, viewing the Earth as a globe is the best representation that we have. It is both proportionate for continental size and true in their shape. But unfortunately, we cannot always keep a massive globe in our pockets. So that being said, we must make maps. So moving further down, we can see that we have three dominant projections, or ways that we can take the globe and project it onto a piece of paper. So this image here is expressing the three different types. So down here it's asking you to identify which is which. So as an example, the cylindrical projection is letter A. Because it's if you have a globe and you wrap a piece of paper in the shape of a cylinder all the way around it, that would represent a cylindrical projection. And again, in addition to the content learned in lecture, a projection is in this sense, essentially, when you have the light bulb on in the inside, the image on the globe is projected onto the surrounding paper. The areas in which the globe is touching the paper that has been wrapped around are what's considered tangent, which means they're an exact replica. But as we get farther away, north or south, uh, from that part of tangency, we can see that these squares become skewed, they become stretched, which means it will lose some of its values or credibility. So down here, be sure to identify which is which, and then to then clearly define, similar to as I did for the first one, define how it works and why it's important. Also know which projection here is best used for, say, Look, you know, making a map along a great circle, or making a map uh, along a small circle, or perhaps making a map of a point. Moving on to page two, we are introduced to topographic maps, looking at the contour lines. So this image in the top right hand corner is a traditional topographic map, of which we will be seeing later on in this lab. You notice the lines that are drawn on there are called contour lines. Each line denotes a specific elevation. So looking at this diagram here in the bottom, we can see that this is a cartoon of an island, and we can see that this is representing, these lines are representing, here's my arrow again, the contour interval. So no matter where I am, as long as I'm on this line on the island, whether I'm on the left side or the right side, I'm still 10 feet above the ocean. Or if I hike up a little bit, this is now 20 foot. It doesn't matter which side I'm on, it, it retains the same value. A way that I think of contour lines is imagine that I wanted to make this cake. And each one of these layers, these 10 foot intervals, is a layer of cake. So if I wanted to carve a cake, I would need one, two, three, four, five, six, I would need eight total cakes that I could stack on top of one another and then I could start carving the shapes. And once I carve the shape of the island you would clearly see these lines. Now in the real world we don't see contour lines on the, on the landscape. Um, this is done just in particular so we can see and correlate elevation as a line. Another thing to note is that contour lines never cross and they will always remain of the same value. Uh, that being said, be sure to read through this content as we move on to the next page, which introduces different types of features. So as an example up in here, uh, you have 
cartoons A, B, and C, what we're seeing is a progression of weathering. So maybe you've seen them come out with a bulldozer and they make the hillside all smooth, and then with a little bit of rain, we start to see these gorges and these areas in which erosion occurs. And then we can see here this very aggressive erosion. So these diagrams here are showing essentially that transition. We also identify that there have been contour lines or an interval that has been placed. In this case, they are 20 foot intervals. This one's 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, and then the highest point there. So we're looking at it as a bird's eye view, and now we get to look at the same area as a map. So again, that idea of the cake layers. So this whole line here, no matter where you are, is 20 feet. This one's 40, so on and so forth. Now the reason that we're looking at this is because notice what happens to these lines. You see this line right here that kind of uh, is perpendicular to everything? That's not a contour line. That's actually a river line, right? This line here, this one here, relates to what's being seen on this bird's eye view. The reason we're looking at this is because relief features are influenced by the drainage of the area. Running water works upon the surface of the ground, eroding and transporting the softer material and leaving the terrain with characteristic valley or ridge patterns. So what we see is that these contour lines begin to kind of change shape. Again, they're not crossing. They don't end abruptly. They just they are not as smooth. We notice that now we have a very distinct U-shape. You, know, you can see lots of these U-shapes between the river gorges. Well, the bottom of the U is pointing downhill, but look between the U's that right along the river point, see that upside down V, it's like an arrow. Well, what's interesting about looking at this type of map here is that I'm allowed to interpret this map. And I can say, ooh, because the contour line makes that pointy shape, like an upside down V, that means that this is upstream, meaning that I'm following these arrows to where the water is coming from knowing that the water is draining down. This is really a great tool when we're looking at a map like this and maybe I can't find very clear uh, numbers for the contour interval. That I'm able to identify that, oh, this is a mountain versus perhaps being uh, a big caldera or a large lake or a hole in the ground. So again, we get to see these differences as we go from something very smooth we start to see beginnings of weathering in stage B, and then C is very aggressively worn and weathered. The bottom image down here is showing another relief feature, which is known as hash lines. What these hash lines do is they tell the reader, the interpreter, which is you and me, that, okay, I can see that there are contour lines, but then I see this extra, these little tick marks, you see it? Well, the tick marks imply to me that, hey, you know what, we're actually not going uphill, things are remaining the same, and in fact, they're going downhill. It may change direction. So you see this bird's eye view in the bottom. See how it's going uphill, uphill, then it smooths out and then dips down, and then it goes back up again. So maybe it's like a moat. You know, you have a castle here, and you have a moat that wraps around. Well, how do we observe or interpret this depression, this change in elevation, looking on a flat map. Well, we can use these tick, mark, these tick marks or the hash lines. So again, these hash lines denote a change in elevation, usually meaning it's the opposite. So the way that I think about them is you see how it's a little mark? I think of those as like little arrows pointing down or opposite of what we were going, right? So in this case, we were going uphill. Now this is pointing downhill. But see how it's met with a partner on the other side pointing the same way? That means it's changing direction again. So that means that this is a little bit of a dip and then it works its way back up. So again, you know, this is just a way that we can interpret maps of these hash lines. So again, how do we denote that we're going uphill, down, then uphill again? Well, we would use these marks. Now, just for fun, if let's say these marks here did not exist, well, what would that mean? Well, that would mean that this topography would go up and then continue to go down, like a big hole in the ground. That's what that would be interpreted. But in our instance here, we have that second set that reminds us that, oh, you know, it's not going to continue to go down, it will go back up. So it creates that moat shape. 
moving on to page four, we get to look at profiles. So when I think of a profile, I think of like the profile of a face. When someone's looking away to the side and their shadow is projected onto a wall, and you can trace the forehead down into the eyes, over into the nose, underneath the nose, across the upper lip into the mouth, and then moving down towards the chin and neck. So you're looking at really the, the design of the face, right, as a singular line. Well, in this case here, a profile, I'm going to use this image as an example down here below. See the arrow? Is that, yeah, okay, I can see that this is a set of contour lines. But let's say I wanted to hike from letter A all the way to B. I know it's a straight line, but is it really going to be a straight walk? And if we can see down below, the answer is no. See how it goes uphill, and then a little bit down, uphill again, and downhill. This would let me know what my journey would look like. Yes, it's in a straight line, but I know it's not level. So look at this diagram here. We see that there's a 10 foot, so that's one layer of cake that's the same. And there's one more stacked here, which is at 20 foot. And then notice that now there's like a cupcake and a second cupcake. This one has a cupcake, a second, and a third cupcake. So what am I saying cupcake for? You know, you have those little desserts. Well, it's not a full piece of cake. It's a smaller round piece. So I know, oops, excuse me, while looking at this diagram, that this side on the right, since it has one, two, three circles, this is taller than this side, which only has one, two. And note the image. It goes up down a little bit higher and then down again. So let's look at this activity. What it's going to have us do is look at the topographic map and match it with the best profile from going left to right. So the same thing. Okay, okay, I see one big line here. Then I see a second one. Then I see a third one. So it's three layers of cake stacked on top of one another. Then I see an individual standalone cupcake here. And then I see another cake another, another, and another. So that implies to me that if I'm walking from here to there, I'm going to go uphill and a little bit down, then really uphill and then really far down. So looking at number one, which one would you think best matches? It would be letter B. B matches number one. So you would write B for answer number seven for topo number one. Something else to consider while you're looking at this is that think of these, I've been comparing it to layers of cake, but now compare them to steps. You know, like when you've gone up the staircase or something like that. The closer the stairs are together, the steeper it is, right? So looking at number four, look at how close these stairs are. That's very, very steep. And then look at how far away they are here. So it's not as steep, right? So maybe you're going to hike a mountain, hiking number four. You have two choices. You go up the steep side or you go down or go up the other side, which is not as great. The gradient is less. So I always compare this in my class when I think about these contour lines, especially looking at the distances between them, is like when dealing with students that um, are perhaps in a wheelchair and they need to use a ramp. So is it better to make the ramp, you know, very steep and close to each other so they can get in their wheelchair or other device from point A to point B in a short period? Or is it more effective to have that spaced out so it's not as steep? And of course, the better answer, the best answer really, is to spread it out. That's the way to do it because that makes it more equitable. It makes it easier and safer for someone to get from one point to the other. So that's why you may often see ramps that are like that. that you know, They take longer to get to that location but it's still going from one to the next. It just takes longer because the gradient is not as great. So anyway, the, the reason I'm saying that is looking at number four, it implies that, okay, these are all individual layers of cake, so it's going to look like a peak. But I see that these are very close on the left-hand side, so the peak is going to be peaked more towards the left. It's going to be faster to the left and then slowly to the right. So which one best matches that one? Well, that would be letter C. So then you have some instructions on how to create one, and guess what? That's what you're going to do next. Here you have a topographic map. You're going to take a piece of paper, like the instructions say, and line it up along here from X to Y. And then every time a contour line crosses this line, you're going to mark your piece of paper. So I would put my 
index card down here along this line so I can mark each one of these, points, these uh, points or pieces. Then you're going to give each one of these a value. So this one here has a value of 0. This line here has a value of 50. This one has a value of 100. Then you literally, your paper that's lined up right here, you're going to bring it down here and plot it. So your first point here is 0 will be here. Your next point here will be spaced that far away and it'll be here. And you'll end up creating a profile down below. So make sure you follow the instructions here on page four as well on page five and that'll be very, very easy to complete. Okay, so make sure you, uh, you follow that. It's gonna be pretty simple. This is where it gets a little more complicated. So now you're gonna take the information learned in lab one and you're going to take some information that was learned in lab two and you're going to solve some questions. So obviously this is a very different environment. We don't have paper maps we're going to look at. So shared right below the download for this lab on, lab on Canvas, you will find uh, this, oh, move that over so we can see it better. This is a PDF version of a topographic map. This is of the Lone Pine Quadrangle, which means it has four corners, four angles. This is a topographic map. You will be utilizing this map to solve the questions on the lab. Now, I'm gonna point out a couple things. Um, the area out here, this is called the collar of the map. The collar of the map has a tremendous amount of information. In fact, sometimes it has more information than what's found on the map itself. See this little corner right here? This is the northwest corner. This is the topo map that belongs there. This is the northern edge. This is the map that belongs if you wanted to continue to glue them together to make one continuous map. For here in the northern edge, you would have to buy an independence map and put that there. See these squares? Here we have numbers 1, and it goes 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. You start looking at that and go, wait a minute, that reminds me of lab 1. This must be township and range. And that's correct. So we have township and range on this map. We certainly have contour lines as well. And we have lots of elevation values. So there's a lot of information. This is a small town of Lone Pine. Alabama Hills, very interesting, interesting. Here's some more information down here. Um, so you, you see there's plenty of information to be observed. Now, a couple things I wanted to point out just looking at this. So again, we're going to learn how to interpret maps, right? So this is, there's all these contour lines are very, very far away from one another. There's one here, another one here, one here. That means it must be very, very flat. But then we get to areas like in here, see how they're so close to one another? That must be an elevated area, like a, bunch, like a little mountain range. And then we move farther up this slope, see how it's getting higher in, in altitude, in elevation? Here's 5,200, uh, here we jump up to 5,600, there's 6,000. So this is going up a hill slope, and then we get into the Sierra Nevada. So you're gonna look for a couple different things. This is the map, you'll find it there. It's a 15-minute series, and you'll learn more about that. It's going to ask you to fill in all these questions. It's going to have you look at the name of the map. Notice the reference map in the bottom. What part of California is this found in? Uh, what is the map that glues to the western side of the map, so on and so forth? So you'll fill that out, and then you'll move down here. It's asking you to list all the townships and ranges that are found on the map. It's asking you to identify the center of the map by identifying the section number, the township, and the range, as well as the extreme northeast corner of the map as well. Then these remaining questions, 25 through 32, are asking you to look for the highest elevation, the lowest elevation, the latitude, and the longitude, and to understand the difference in degrees, minutes, and seconds of this map, and to understand what series map would this be because of that. The last question is kind of a, a, a deep thought question because you will find, obviously, I'm going to flip back to the map, this is a rectangle. But you will find that the data suggests that this map is an equal square. And it's not. So you have to ask yourself, why? Why does it look like a rectangle? And I'll give you a hint. Remember that as you gain latitude. As you move away from the equator and head towards the North Pole, what happens to the distance around the Earth? It becomes smaller. So perhaps the maps 
also become smaller, right? You know, we learned before, it's still a circle, right? It's just a smaller circle. It's a smaller distance. So that's something to keep in mind when answering that short answer. Then, the last page here is an extra credit activity. I highly suggest that you do it. It will take you all of 20 minutes to complete. Um, a couple things to know about it. It takes you step by step. It's super easy to do. First, you must download Google Earth Pro. You cannot use Google Maps. You cannot use the application. You must download Google Earth Pro. So this must be done on a laptop or a desktop. It cannot be completed on a tablet or an iPhone or an Android. It needs to be an actual computer of some sort. It takes you step by step in which you will use the draw tool and you will be measuring the perimeter of Lake Piru in August of 2002 and to compare the drawing again of what Lake Piru is today and you'll learn how to do that on here so there's a, a, a place on the canvas module where you will be able to upload this answer key as well as the drawing to prove to me that you did trace the perimeter of both August 2002 and in the current date. Again, this is extra credit. This is the one of the only extra credit assignments you will have this semester. So please, please make sure that you complete it, okay? So again, you're going to need two things this lab. You're going to need the lab number two. I'm going to scroll back to the top. You will also need to download the Lone Pine Quadrangle so you can zoom in. It's saved as a PDF so you can zoom in and zoom out. I'll show you here. Um, so, I mean, it's not the greatest quality because it's a, a low value image, but it's good enough. You can see it. I'm not asking you to get too crazy in there. I'm looking for you to, to identify the highest point and the lowest point, so on and so forth. So you'll be able to do that. Again, you'll see the numbers here. 118, 15. This is 118 degrees in 15 minutes. This number here represents the longitude on the western edge. This 36 degrees and 45 minutes. This 36, 45 represents the latitude of the northern part of this map. Remember, latitude goes all the way across. Longitude goes straight up and down. So I think that's enough information to get you going. Uh, be sure to uh, take advantage of some of the additional videos and content shared without the modules so you can make sure you can get this done in advance and uh, I appreciate your time and we'll talk soon.